Hi, you guys. Hi, you guys. I don't know if anyone is out there because it's not our usual time. It's a weird time to be here. It's a Saturday time because it seems all our Sundays are spent on planes these days. It's our new thing. Yeah, we just go to the airport on, on Sundays and just go round and round in little light air aircraft um, just to make ourselves feel better. No, we just have all this travel lined up. And so we. I, I said, I cannot. I will not miss another gathering room. No, there will not be two consecutive she weeks without a gathering for room. I can't stand that. I can't. It's like my life support. Yeah. So here we are on a it's Saturday. And if you're years. watching this on Sunday, oh, somebody's here. Aha, guess who's here? Donna, 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 Donna. Okay, so we got to show, we got to do the dance. First, we're going to show now, the Rowie. Wait, the grace, for those of you who have not tuned in before, Note the gracious badger hairstyle. Um, I, I intend that Rel become the editor in chief of a magazine called Gracious Badger Living um, uh, Refugees from Climate Change 2019. But yes, all of that just to say that she has become a gracious badger. You know, and then life. look, look what Donna did give us. Gracious, I can't get in it. Gracious <laughs> badger. And then look, look, I've look, got look. a brand. Yes, and look at this. Gracious Badger fan! Woo! We're branded. We're branded! That's awesome. Yay! Thank you, Donna. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, everybody. Um, we got lots of people. We're coming. getting some people. They're coming even on a Saturday, the last of the days in the week. Yeah, I don't actually subscribe to that. I am really a Monday begins the week kind of person. Even in Chinese, Splitting the weekend. Sunday why is called literally Sunday. It's week, it goes weekday one, weekday two, weekday three, week, all the way through weekday six, and then Chan. I think Chan, sorry. Chan, Sunday. Sunday. It's amazing. But why would you split it? Like, I just don't see, like, it's Sundays are hard enough without trying to split them for, away from Saturdays. They're their beloved cousin. I don't know. Just let them stay together, man. Monday, we That's all good know topic. Monday begins. That would be a good topic. Oh, we yeah. have over 104 people. <laughs> Go. Okay. Today we're talking about I'm out of here. expectations. Like you probably expect that I will now take over and do like 15 minutes of yakety yakety yak. Because ask questions. Ask questions in the in the comments, and I will answer them in 15 minutes. But. We did promise to talk today about expectations and I thought it was a very good topic because here is what I have learned over the course of 20 something years, coaching a whole bunch of people and watching a whole bunch of other people. This is what I found. People think that they get what they intend and they think that they're gonna get what they put on their vision boards and they think that they're gonna get what they work for. But what I have found is that people usually get what they expect, but not in their brain box, but in a deep sort of sensory memory slash mood sort of way. The biggest place I see this is with money. It's easy to quantify money with numbery numbers, so you can really see how expectation works. I cannot tell you how many times I have worked with someone poor, and we worked and worked and worked at getting them to raise their expectations about money and they did get more money. Yes, they did. And then something would happen. Either they would be in an accident or they'd get sick or they would simply end up giving away their money or they would lose a whole bunch of cash or do something, in, invest in some ridiculous thing. They always ended up exactly where they were used to being. And they never, like, there were people who were at the poverty line and I would coach them for free. They would go up above the poverty line and then immediately come back down. Then there were other people I coached who were zillionaires for no particular reason. Like they'd just been raised in wealthy families and they just expected that they would always have a lot of money. And there was no reason that they should have had a lot of money. Like they didn't have major skills. They, didn't, they weren't contributing much to the world. But somehow, and it wasn't just from their parents, somehow the world always gave them the amount of money they were used to having. Liz Gilbert likes to tell a story about a prince who decides that he's not going to be a prince anymore. He wants to understand how the people live. So he goes, he strips off all his finery and he goes in a little cloth and he walks out into the forest and he tries to just live off the land and he's starving and he's filthy and these bandits find him and they capture him and tie him up and take him back 
to their camp. And then it just strikes them for no particular reason that they're going to have a fun game and they're going to pretend that he's the prince of the world. And they make a little fake throne and they start bringing him things and they make a game out of it. But he ends up being the prince anyway. I don't know what this story comes from, but I think it illustrates a really interesting point because I see this over and over and over. People rise to whatever level they expect, or they sink to whatever level they expect. This gets really scary when you look at something called expectancy theory. And in the 1960s, they did an experiment which they can never repeat because it's considered in, inhumane and immoral now. They didn't know. They went in at the time and they just told a bunch of grade school teachers, half your students are gifted to average, but most of them are gifted. And then the other half, way below average, up to average, but not really. So they didn't do anything else. They just told the teacher, these are the names of the students who are gifted. These are the names of the students who were who are slow. At the end of the, the year, they did IQ tests on the students. Now, this is very important because IQ tests are not supposed to vary at all over time, even with educational credentials. The idea is to see the innate intelligence and it's not supposed to change, it's very rigorously created. The students who the teacher expected to do well had an average of 20 IQ points over the ones she expected to do badly. Now at the beginning they tested them, it was random. The expectation of the teacher, which was never explicitly voiced, changed these kids' IQ tests. Scary! That means that not only do we expect things of ourselves that tend to happen, but we expect things of other people that make them happen, make them behave in the way that we expect. That's very scary. Now, I can't believe that that teacher's expectation is going to chase those children throughout their lives. I've got to believe that somewhere they're going to meet someone who expects them to do well and they're going to rise above that because for the other, the idea that that one research condition would shape the rest of their lives is just too awful for me to think about. I expect people to rise to their highest level. This may be one reason I'm a coach. I just freaking expect people to rise to their highest level. I believe that everybody can be successful. I believe that everybody can be happy. And I think sometimes I'm so obsessed with my belief that people who are in the room are like, yeah. Oh, she may be right. I may have some game after all. Well, I'm not going to try to lose that. Final story. You know, the whole thing about wealth. I was obsessed with this for years. I was like marking all my clients, like seeing how they, how they express their expectations of life and then how life either answered or did not answer that expectation. And during this time, I went to Kenya and I met some people in an organization called Jami Bura, which means good people. I hope I got that right. Uh, and it was a group of 300,000 Nairobi street beggars who managed to get out of poverty. Most of these people were female and all of them had had the absolute worst beginning you can imagine, right? Like poverty beyond anything that American impoverished people could possibly imagine. And I thought, okay, there has to be some kind of micro lending or something that got them out of the poverty trap, which I had studied extensively, by the way. So I sat down with a few of these women and I asked them, what was it that changed your fortune? Was it that you got micro loans from this organization? Was it that um, you, you had family help? Was it a stroke of luck? Not a single one of them said that. They said there was this Swedish woman and she came to Nairobi and she would sit down with us and tell us to expect a different life. She would create a story about what our lives could be and it caught on. They would, each woman would say, it caught in my mind. I had an image and then I expected it to happen because she did. So I just started doing better and that story was very strong in my mind. So I realized when I was, um, when I was talking to these women, absolute overwhelming power of expectation to shape all the vagaries of our existence, to shape the way we respond. We have so many millions of decision points every single day, every minute of every day. We make a decision between doing this and doing that. And it's driven by our expectations 
attention. And it works in such a way that what we expect keeps coming. And we call that reality. But I do believe it starts in the mind with expectation. So what do you do then with expectation that is genuine and it feels like, okay, now I've got my expectations up and it's going to work. I've done this over and over and over. And generally, the things I expect are quite a bit better <laughs> than what actually happens. Sometimes what I expect is worse. I'm stopping right now because I am just parsing the difference between what I expect with my mind and what I expect with my soul. And I don't mean my emotions, even though that part of the body actually can make decisions and it affects the brain very strongly. I mean something that is actually within me and in my heart more than my brain, but also extends beyond me. And I have to say that when I've expected the impossible in that particular way, the impossible good has happened. And when I expect the possible good with my brain, it often doesn't happen to the point where I've almost abandoned expecting this up here. And I'm completely focused on expecting what my soul feels is coming. The interesting thing about that is that what my soul expects more than anything else is a gradual awakening out of suffering. And it's not interested in things like, oh, your book will be on the bestseller list, or you know, you'll get to do all these fancy things and have possessions and stuff. It really, truly isn't interesting interested in that. I wish it were. My head wishes it were that, and that it did expect those things. All it really expect is a, expects is a gradual awakening out of suffering. Sometimes that has seemed very improbable, like when I was told I had diseases that were not curable and that I'd be in pain forever, and I just didn't expect that to be true. And it was a long haul, but it, it turned out that the expectation of my soul went, came true. My body changed. The pain changed. It mostly went away. Okay, all of this to tell you that your soul is guiding you very carefully and what it expects is very likely to happen in your life. It's very slow and steady, but your mind and the cultural influence is on your mind may cause your expectations to swing wildly from what your soul knows is true. Some of us expect things to go very badly, much worse than they should go for us, and it happens. Others of us expect things to go very well, and against all the odds, it happens. So how do you live? Because you're gonna have this brain with its expectations your whole life, and its expectations are powerful, and you may not have access to your soul at all times. Well, I live, I don't know if we've talked before in these gathering rooms about uh, comedy improv and the rules that guide it. Improvisational comedy is you and a bunch of people on a stage making up a scene in real time and nobody knows what's going to happen. And it has two rules. And I used to I used to ditch class in high school and go off with a bunch of other kids who loved we were the we were the renegades of the school. We'd all go to an empty classroom and practice comedy improv. This is this was my kind of living hard. And there were two rules to comedy improv. One say yes to whatever happens. Because if you say no to anything, the whole scene comes to a stop. So if I come in, if somebody comes in and says, um, there's an ostrich outside and it's wearing your father's suit, and you say, no it isn't, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, boom, scene stops. So instead you say, yes and. So whatever life brings you, even if it's not what you expect, you say, okay, this is happening. Yes, I'll say yes to this. And I'm going to do the next thing. And then you create a new expectation. Not so that you can force the world to, to do what you want. And not so that you can be disappointed when nothing happens. But to keep the game alive. To keep the fun alive. So the first rule is say never say no to life. Say yes and. The next one is have a plan always have a plan always expect something i used to try and not expect everything anything it doesn't work you guys we always expect something that's how the brain works but you have that plan inside you and you know that it will change so those of you who have trained as coaches in my system one of the first thing you've learned things you've learned is to say tell me where i'm getting things wrong i don't think any other coaching system teaches that 
It was taught at Harvard Business School by a guy named Chris Argerus, who found out that businessmen who are willing to ask folks where they're wrong do phenomenally well in business. Most people will go to the ends of the earth to avoid saying, am I wrong? Tell me for sure if I'm wrong. I want to know I'm not gonna get upset. Tell me where I'm wrong is a brand of, I have a plan and I'm willing to change it. So if I'm sitting with you as a coach, I might say, here's what I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking um, you've got really high expectations and your heart keeps getting crushed and you're trying to get rid of all your expectations, but I may be projecting, tell me where I'm wrong. And I really wanna know. And if you tell me, no, you are projecting. I really, I don't do that. I'm totally okay with it. Does it, does my ego still want to be right? every time but i have taught it to have a plan and change it to have a theory and change it to be willing to say i will totally i have this massive plan and i will completely surrender it the moment i find out i'm wrong and i will create another plan and what that does is it makes it's kind of like skiing or even walking you know the the fact that we can walk on two feet is very bizarre very few people i mean very few animals can do it quite a few people can do it as it turns <laughs> out uh, the gracious badger is laughing at me um with, you. with me but if you talk to a physiologist or a kinesiologist about how people walk on just two feet they'll tell you that compared to a four-legged animal it's really just a controlled fall like every time we take a step, we start to fall forward, stick one foot out and catch ourselves, then fall, stick another foot out and catch ourselves. It's always falling and always catching. And that's how expectation works in a life that feels rich and healthy and fun. It's not a frozen things have to feel that have to happen this way. It's not a complete denial of all expectation. It's I'm gonna expect this, and when that falls apart, I'm gonna have another thing that I think up right away. And when that falls apart, I'm gonna have another thing that I think up right away. And I'm always gonna expect that the game will be worth playing. It'll be hard, It'll I'll, I'll have blood, sweat, and tears, but it's worth being here. This is my expectation, and I may be wrong. And when I find out I'm wrong, I'll just find another plan. So that is my little spiel on expectation right now. Let's all of us think of something we expect to happen tomorrow. I'll be on a plane again. Let's say I get there and the plane can't take off. Fabulous night at an airport hotel. No worries. Suppose the plane goes to a different city. I've had that happen. Hmm. Skyping with all the loved ones I was going to meet with and then flying to my ultimate destination. No problem. There are ways to make it all work. And it's all about having the adventure. It's all improv comedy. Yes, and I had a plan. Okay, now I'm gonna change it. This is what makes life fun. That is what I have to say about that. And oh, Melanie Phoenix is having a wild hailstorm that just like flashed on my screen. Um, so now the gracious badger re-enters the scene. Ooh. Okay, I love this topic. I just wanna say because I think that I don't know if I'm like you guys, but I have a tendency to have an expectation and when it is thwarted, I just go, well, I don't have to do anything now. And it's that's not useful either and it's quite disempowering. So I love this new plan. Part of your plan can be to have a short tantrum. It's always in my plan. Well, as you know quite well, that that is always part of my plan. <laughs> it's part of gracious badger living. <laughs> gracious badger living. Gracious badger living. I tantrums. tantrums. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Now, just imagine with your eyeballs and your glasses. All right. Here I am. Here I am. And I have a great question from Holly, who says, "How can you change your expectations when you may not be aware of them?" I thought this Ooh. was an excellent question. You're aware of your expectations when something happens and it hurts your feelings, because you didn't think that would happen. When you're surprised, well, I guess it could make feelings happier too. I have been happily surprised and gotten things I didn't expect on a good way. But surprise always means that you had an expectation about something and it didn't come true. So then you can go, oh, I'm surprised. I wonder what I was expecting. And you can see, oh, I can expect better. I am the prince in the forest, didn't expect that. And oh, maybe I should uh, not expect quite so many things. Okay, that did not, my book did not sell 10 million copies. Hmm, maybe I should lower that expectation and start looking at quality over quantity, that kind of thing. Okay.
Okay, do we have any other questions? I just want to say, Christy, I really loved your first question, but could you just condense it a little bit and I'll be able to, it's just a little bit too long for us to We have a lot of tantrum use. fans. How do you define between conscious expectations and subconscious? Um, one of the interesting things about uh, integrity, as you know, one of my obsessions, is that the subconscious becomes conscious. And it's part of the game is to see what are my conscious expectations and what I what am I subconsciously expecting. The subconscious expectations are the ones that drive everything. I'm telling you this right now. It's subconscious feelings that they're, they're subliminal and they take place in sort of the animal nervous system and the neocortex, which is thinking verbally, doesn't know what the hell that is the whole beast is planning to do so how do you know your subconscious expectations and that i think is where um stillness and insight come in so any kind of insight meditation if you sit and you describe your own feelings for 15 minutes i did this for an hour today it was like oh thank god i hadn't had a whole hour for a long time and it's like a whole layer of conscious expectations comes up and then all these different emotions and and then up come the subconscious expectations and there's always a sense of relief as your mind comes into harmony with the subconscious expectation. So at least you're talking to each other. And there's a harmony in that that's actually very powerful. And the expectations that come from the meeting of head and heart, that can actually really transform your life. But it's worth the time to take insight, to sit in insight and notice what's coming up without trying to control it. I would add that if you find yourself having a sudden tantrum, it may be that there's a subconscious expectation there that mm. has been thwarted. Uh -huh. One little signpost there. Um, Geordie is asking, do you think that it comes from a place of lack? Um, there's a belief that you can't create a new expectation, that you are limited in your ability to create. Well, that's an expectation. So I have a very strong expectation that I will always be able to create new expectations. And I think I was thinking today about how I manhandled my my worldview to make everything that happened to me seem positive to myself so that I could stand it because I have a very low threshold of standing things. So, you know, I was thinking how no matter what happened, I would be like, I'll tell you why this is an advantage, because being in constant pain is making me more able to find compassion and become psychic because I can't move my body at all. So I have to do, I don't know, astral travel. I mean, whatever it was, I would try to find a way to expect something good to come of it. I don't know if that's, I was wondering today, is that my natural temperament or is that something that I learned to expect along with everything else? I think it's something all of us want. But we wouldn't even be here gathering here if we didn't want things to go well and if we didn't think there was something in our spirits that is guiding what happens to our bodies and our lives so i think below the level of dim expectations there is the soul level of huge expectations but not the expectations that might come from the mind like my mind may have expected like once I, they were offering my me my own radio show and I kind of expected that. I got such a horrible clenched sore throat. My larynx didn't work for two years. That went away. Clearly, that wasn't the right thing for my soul and it didn't happen the way I expected. But the continuous evolving out of suffering went even faster. And, and over time, that's become my soul focused expectation. I don't know if that helps. I have a one. I'm sure it does. I have a wonderful question here from Trisha, who says, "How do you elevate the genuine expectations without trying to force a situation?" That's a good question. You know what? You you enjoy the expectation for itself. So, right now, it's just between you and me. There is a possibility that one of my books could be picked up as a movie happened before and it didn't end up being anything and this probably won't either the probab the probabilities are tiny but I have enjoyed not exactly expecting it but I've enjoyed the contemplation of it but I enjoy the contemplation of it knowing that that is my plan that may have to change knowing that I may be wrong 
And, but it's not like, I'm not going to expect it because that would make me happy and then I'd be disappointed. No, I'm going to actually enjoy the expectation for itself. And then I will have spent time enjoying that expectation, whatever happens. And if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to be mad at myself for enjoying the expectation of something good because expectation in and of itself is one of the beautiful things life has to offer. And I intend to, del to have delicious ones and savor them always. Can I suggest something? And I don't know if it's right. So you tell me where I'm wrong. Seems to me like that kind of enjoyment that you're talking about is what happens when something's the function of imagination. Mm. And I don't mean imagination in the sense of Lala, it'll never happen, but using that faculty right. um, of like, oh, imagine if one of my books was made into a movie or a series or something. And, and you can play with that in the imagination in a way that is quite different from I expect that at 9 a.m. I will enter my office. Mm, there's yeah. something, to me, there's a different part of the mind yeah. that is engaged there and one is much more playful and, well, and powerful. Than it can be. This is what I think, that 99.99% of all our suffering is the, is the misuse of our imagination. Ooh. And it's imagination shaped by culture that is most often misused. So I will go into my office, I will get this done, it's a very cultural expectation and it has a, a, a kind of lock on it. That's not, a, that is still imagination, but it's not imagination free and, and delirious and creative. It's imagination as slave to culture. And guess what? It will create what we expect pretty powerfully. But if you say to yourself, everything except this moment here is my imagination. Everything that ever happened is only existing in my mind right now. It's all imagination. Even memory is imagination. Anything that could happen for the rest of my life is imagination. So I could imagine that tomorrow at nine, I will go into my office and, and have a rigorous time of it. Or I could imagine that at nine o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to receive some sort of massive inspiration that is going to make the whole day incredible. You know, I could, I could imagine that at nine o'clock tomorrow, my mind will open to something amazing. I could imagine that at nine o'clock tomorrow, um, I'm going to decide not to go into my office and I'm going to run off into the woods and live off the land. I could play with the imagination and then make decisions about what to do in a kind of comedy improv way. So, but it, it requires this really, really rigorous attention to integrity. Again, I always come back to this, not just this loosey goosey imagination, because that again is going to be based on culture. Like we could go into a sort of new age imagination where everything is rainbows and unicorns but it's still cultural. It's just from a different part of culture. But the yeah. imagination that comes from the satisfaction of integrity, like tomorrow at nine o'clock, I am going to do what is absolutely right for me, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And if it's not what culture says, I will do whatever it says and nothing will hurt me. That's a different kind of imagination. Yeah, I think there's, I, I guess, I think, I mean, you know, Patricia's question was about trying to force a situation. And I mm. think maybe that's where the the um, disconnect is, because I still think that, yes, you can imagine mm, like that, but I uh, like a reflective kind of imagination that's a storytelling thing. I feel like it's it's almost like a semantic thing that we're, we're kind of talking about because um, there's a forcing imagination and um, a creating imagination. Here's the thing. The forcing feels like forcing. Yeah. <laughs> and the creativity feels like flow. Mm. So you will often find that you are imagining something dark and awful and it still feels forced. Like say you've, you've had your heart broken, then you fall in love again, but you expect to have your heart broken again because it hurt so much the last time. And so you keep trying to turn this current love affair into something damaging or painful that you can run away from. It will feel forced. It will feel forced into the negative by your expectation. If on the other hand, you just refuse to stop loving, my best example of that is pretty much any dog you'll ever meet. They do not mind that they have been mistreated. They will just, you know, they'll, they may expect bad treatment for a second, but as soon as you give them the slightest ability to feel safe, they will expect that everyone will love them and they will love everyone else. They are just born that way. Like, I think that might be the takeaway of this entire gathering room, to expect the way a dog expects. 
And if you don't know a dog, just find one. He'll expect you to love him. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you hate dogs, that dog will be absolutely certain that you are meant to be good friends. I love that dog already. That dog is awesome. Hmm. No. All right. Um, gosh, I hope this helps. I do think that most of what we live goes on in the field of our expectation followed rapidly by the improv comedy of life. And that we can live in either brutal fatalism because our expectations aren't met, or we can let go of expectation, not so that we never expect, but that, so we're continuously re expecting something new. And if we can learn to expect like a dog, please go look up Ozzy the pit bull and his family of kittens. This wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> this wonderful pit ball, these murderous dogs that kill everything. He lived with a cat who had kittens and he liked the kittens better than the mom did. And you should just see Ozzy and those kittens and the joy of something he never expected, but he always kind of expected it because he's a dog. And that's just what they expect. Love, 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 love. So we're going on a plane. Blah, blah, blah. We're leaving on a jet plane. We'll be back again by next. Sunday, and we sure hope sure you'll join us. True, actually, we'll we'll keep stay. We'll keep you posted. I don't know what to expect. Are we no. going to be on? We don't even on know Sunday? how we expect what's in our calendar. Are we coming back on Saturday. I don't know. I don't know. But we are going to do our level best. I will be here on. I fully expect to be in this spot on Sunday, coming up a week from tomorrow to be with my peeps in the gathering the room. Yes, that's true. You come on. Yes, and only time will tell. I'll see it one way or the other. I will see you. Yeah. Mwah. Mwah. Expect it. Mwah, 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 mwah.